Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Key at SB Grid. Thanks for joining on today. Um, so uh, today is uh, myself and Carol Hurry from the group. We're going to be talking about SB Grid. I think that the, um, the group is probably manageable enough that we can make it more discussion style. If you want to interject or you have questions, uh, happy to take those. You can also just send them by chat. We can field them kind of at the end. But uh, uh, I think that, uh, yeah, the discussion would be easily managed. Um, so I'm going to switch over to my uh, slides here. Does it, can you see it? Yep. All right. Apparently, Zoom has to be on the monitor where the slides are. So all right, great. So today, uh, we're going to talk about you know, SB Grid software installation and the environment. I'm going to take the installation side. Carol's going to follow up later with the uh, um, SB Grid capsule environment. Um, feel free to send questions by chat. I think uh, Carol and Pete will see those, and we can pass them on, and I think we can unmute and kind of discuss as uh, need be. I think everybody knows a bit about SP Grid, but just to make sure it's you know clear what, who we are and what we do, we're a nonprofit service center based at Harvard Medical School. Uh, we sort of grew out of Steve Harrison's lab about 10 years ago um, before I was at HMS. I've been with the group for eight years, uh, and our goal is to minimize the tech barrier between computing uh, researchers, structural biology data, and you know, papers and publication, right? scientific results. So um, I'm a structural biologist by background, uh, as is Pete Meyer, but the team is diverse. We've got you know, software engineers, we have bioinformaticians, bio we have uh, solid tech staff who help us keep all of our uh, computers and data center running. And so uh, we're here to support structural biology research computing. Uh, the consortium is growing, so it's uh, we've got almost 400 members now. I think it's 395 on our website, and so in about 20 countries. And uh, when I put up this beautiful picture of um, SARS-CoV-2 spike from Bing Chen's lab uh, here at HMS, uh, just as a a little bit of eye candy, but also to just point out that SB Grid as structural biology sort of support is defined. Uh, my definition is loose, like anything that uh, you know, produces or works with molecular models or um, uh, you know, ends up producing molecular models, that is X-ray crystallography, NMR, cryo-electron microscopy, molecular dynamics, uh, virtual screening, um, protein design, all of these tools uh, fall within our uh, support jurisdiction. Um, uh, so I think we're best known for our scientific software stack. So we support We've got about 450 applications uh, that we update and support for Mac and Linux. Uh, we also support our members with hardware expertise. So we are fortunate enough to be at Harvard Medical School where we are affiliated with um, the uh, Harvard uh, cryo-electron microscopy facility. In fact, our data center is in the facility. And so uh, you know, we've got, um, we're working on the front lines with researchers who, uh, collecting terabytes of data a day and need storage and GPUs and workstations and the whole, um, the whole gambit for uh, structural biology. So we, we're fortunate enough that we can um, get exposed to a lot of hardware. Uh, uh, we also support our software by email. We support um, uh, both in a sort of domain specific way, like how do I scale this diffraction data or um, uh, a, uh, this looks like a bug in this application. Can you help me fix it sort of way? Uh, we also have a training and outreach element that we usually do in-person workshops. Um, uh, we've done uh, some virtual based because of the COVID situation. I think we're gonna go back to in-person as soon as we can, but um, we, uh, we work to connect the developers who write the software who are scientists themselves uh, in almost all cases with the scientists who are using the software so that um, you can, uh, you can bring your questions, you can bring your concerns, you can bring your tough data sets to um, uh, the developers of these tools and say, you know, what do you think of this? Uh, how would you do this? I know the developers are psyched to see this stuff. You know, I think the last time we did this, it was Kai Diedrichs. You know, you bring Kai a tough X-ray diffraction data set and he is, he's excited to help people through it. He wants people to use the tools that he's working on and building. and. Uh, and he likes to see uh, you know, sort of challenging uh, things. And I think all the developers are sort of in that camp. Um, 
So today I'm going to talk about how we install software. I think um, since that's what most people use, uh, we've installed software in the past. We sort of started out with this big collection of tools and uh, we had some installation scripts that would um, allow you to sort of replicate that you know, between a few labs and then uh, SB Grid grew. And so you know we got to about a hundred labs. We built uh, sort of a web-based control panel for ourselves so that we can control what software goes where based on licensing and the types of labs that are served. Um, and then SB Grid kept growing. Uh, so we, you know, we built a new one that had new functionality where we could add and remove titles and have more sophisticated logic around who gets what. And then, uh, and as um, uh, the software stack itself grew, you know, people don't necessarily want to have such a huge software stack on their, you know, on their laptop, or maybe they don't have uh, an NFS share that they share out to 20 machines in their group. They've got, you know, different network setups or different storage setup. So um, this sort of grew out of the need of individual labs or to, to be able to install software selectively and uh, on, on a laptop or up to a cluster um, with just the tools they want. So, and so I've got a little screenshot here to let to, uh, so this is a command line tool, um, uh, but it serves as the core for uh, where we see the future going and I'll talk more about that. Um, so uh, this is the command line installer for Mac and Linux. Um, it's just a single binary. You can just download it and run it. You don't need libraries. You don't need prerequisites. It uh, should work on just about any um, modern Mac or Linux distribution. I know for a fact you know, it works on seven, Sense 7, Sense 8, the RELs, uh, all the Ubuntu's I've tested, Debian, um, and then Mac OS from 10.13 up to 10.16. Well, I guess they're calling it Mac OS uh, 11 now. So, um, uh, and it allows you to install, remove, and update titles. It's kind of like a package manager, like you would expect, you know, like Yum or Apt, if you're familiar with those, maybe Brew or, um, you know, Mac ports. I think, you know, Fink is kind of a memory, but you might remember that was sort of an early Mac package manager. But it differs. Uh, in some ways in that it, um, you know, it's SP Grid centric. So it downloads from our servers, uh, tools we install, the tools we maintain, and they're the same ones that you get if you have like a site installation at your site. Um, uh, and the difference there is that we work to make sure that the requirements are met between tools in a more than a programmatic way. Like you can set things up so that the libraries are there and they work and that's great. And that's what brew does, right? So if you brew install a tool, it, you get the libraries that you need, but it doesn't necessarily account for the fact that if you install X, um, you know you might need Y for complete functionality, or you might need Z. So, a couple of examples, right? Like Phoenix doesn't come with Coot, right? So, you might need Coot if you want the full functionality of Phoenix, or Phoenix also doesn't come with Rosetta, and Rosetta is a critical part of a number of the applications within it, and so. We know these things because we're structural biologists and we work with these tools and we get requests from our users. So even if they're things that you know, are a little outside our sort of domain, we can make sure that things get bundled so that they work when you get them. Uh, and if they don't, you can drop us an email and we'll fix it. So, so, um, uh, so you can do all that within the install client. Um, you can get info about the titles. So we include references, we include uh, the websites for, um, documentation, manuals if they're out there, uh, maybe um, forums or you know, obviously the application website itself. Um, uh, all of that's included. We maintain that. We track all of those things. Hopefully when those links expire, or, you know, some tools are old and their websites have sort of gone away, but we try to uh, keep all of that stuff up to date. Um, what's new in this sort of new iteration is that we've included better diagnostics and troubleshooting. So you can do uh, there are certain requirements to install SP Grid and to sort of connect to our network. So this will sort of tell you. Uh, right now it's a little elementary, but you know, when things um, uh, aren't working to like connect to our servers or you know, if you're missing certain dependencies. Uh, a big plus on this too is that we can do multi-threaded transfers. So if you do, uh, you, know, you install a big set of tools, right? So if you install Phoenix and Rosetta and uh, I don't know, something else big like Cypion or uh, CSP4, 
Right? You can do individual, those all run in parallel. So you can get it all at once. You don't have to wait for a big serial transfer. Um, and then built into this, we also have an automated, what we call the admin mode, where you can set it up as, uh, as a recurring cron job. And it will just check for updates, check for new titles, install them, remove the old ones that uh, you know, are obsolete and no longer support, and you can just let it run. So obviously this wouldn't be great on a laptop. You don't want your software to update while you're like on a plane or something back when we used to fly places. But the, um, uh, for Linux servers, it's particularly great. For Mac workstations, it's great. You can just let it ride. And because it's surgical about the updates, it just gets what you need. It removes just the things that, uh, so the updates are quick. I mean, uh, you can run it in sort of a rolling mode so that your software is up to date. You get the titles 10 minutes after we install them. So you know, our workflow is we install in the dev environment, we test, we test on a few different platforms, we push it to our production. Um, and then from there, the API picks it up and it becomes available right in the command line client. If, you're, uh, if you check for updates, you'll get it right away. Our previous sort of legacy mode is we batch all the updates and send them out once a month. That's also good. I mean, it's great for stability. Your plat, you know, your software doesn't change, but because we retain all the old versions anyway, it's rare that we would sort of yank a version out from underneath you. So you can usually update pretty safely, even with uh, you know, processes running. Um, so I mentioned before, we've got a Linux and a Mac version. Uh, you do need an account for this. This is sort of based around individuals. So you, if you're an IT manager or you, you, know, you are sysadmin for the lab or something, you, you can get an account and install multiple machines. You can install to an NFS share, whatever you'd like to do. But we really base it around sort of an individual because um, generally speaking, we have, for every installation, we have an individual that's you know, the sort of point person for installing them. So. It just makes sense to set these up as an individual registration. Um, if that doesn't work for you, if you just say, hey, we're a team, I mean, you know, our crew here is a team, right? Like we have some shared uh, emails that we both all monitor, and you know, we want requests to feed into our ticketing system so we can all see them, right? We like to be able to go on vacation and know that people are watching these things. So uh, just get in touch. We can help set something up. It doesn't have to necessarily be chiseled in stone that this is the way it is. Um, and obviously you need to have uh, network connectivity. Specifically, we use rsync for our transfers. Uh, so you have to be able to get outbound rsync. We have a few different um, ports that uh, you can connect on and it tries the different ports to help get out of your institution if, you're, um, if you don't necessarily have you know, outbound 873. But uh, and we're happy to work with institutions to make sure that you can uh, you can get connectivity if it's not set up. These days, you know the, you know, it, we are always under constant assault by you know the internet trying to break in, right? That that's that's nothing new. But since the COVID situation started, it's sort of escalated, and I think that goes for probably everyone in this call. The um, so institutions are locking things down. I think uh, so. We're happy to you know work with groups. Uh, you know, we can assure people that this. Our software stack lives on three machines in our data center in at Harvard with limited access, and uh, we can we don't store this in the cloud. Uh, we don't download from other machines. So uh, right now, it's um, uh, it's possible to just lock it down to our IP and go from there. Um, all right. So uh, go ahead. Um, Ken was wondering what's the difference between SP Grid and SP Grid CLI as commands. Oh, I think they're the same. They're just um, uh, SP Grid was sort of the original name. We had like an SP Grid name, but it um, it turned out to be confusing for people. So now we just use both as a sort of way to move away from SP Grid as a command into the CLI as the command. It sort of is borrowed from. There's an AWS CLI, there's a GitHub CLI, like CLIs have become this kind of uh, universal suffix to a command that you would just say, this is a command line tool for interacting with an API to you know, use a service. So it made sense to, as, a, as a sort of way to, to move. Um, but uh, 
there was like a long time ago, a tool called SB Grid in the software tree that would give you sort of info about packages. We sort of moved over to this and deprecated that a while back. It's still, I mean, uh, we still include the SB Grid command. We intend to uh, keep it, but I think the CLI is uh, sort of the future. Eventually, maybe we'll deprecate the other one, but enough people use it that I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want to pull it anytime soon. Right, so, um, so I'm not going to go through every command line option for this whole thing. I think that that would be a bit of a snooze fest. But I, I do want to show just some examples of like three different aspects of uh, how this looks. Right, so uh, one from installing. Um, another one from uh, some diagnostics, and then uh, just the info that we include that you can access from the command line. So, so here I'm just going to install um, a title so I can list everything that's available, grabs everything from SP Grid. Uh, you can see it's a huge list, so you might want to grab some of that stuff out. I'm going to rerun it with the, the long format, which will just show me everything in, in one big list, all the different versions, the last time it was updated. Um, and updates in SP Grid are not necessarily the developer updates. Sometimes we fix a bug or we make a mistake in the configuration, we have to fix it. And so uh, that's our internal update string, but that's what you want, right? So if it's, um, uh, and so then from there, I'm gonna install iMod. I'm picking a version that's not, um, not the default. So if I, I can specify that on the command line, so I put an iMod at, 4.11.0, so that's one version back. You can see that it's going to grab uh, OpenJDK because iMod needs Java. So we include the Zulu Java. It gets iMod, and then it does the download. New version has this spiffy uh, progress bar. Um, so you can actually tell that it's doing something. So that's great. So it'll go through and download these. Um, uh, and uh, you get some you know, indications of progress, transfer speed. Um, the old version would just kind of sit there and uh, you wouldn't know necessarily if it was doing anything. I mean, I would you know, open another terminal and just see, is it running? Or, but um, Jason, this way at least you can see. Jason, can you make the screen bigger? It's hard to read. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is the smallest one. I, am, I don't know if I can make this one bigger, but uh, let me see. I don't think I can on this one, but the next one's bigger. So. Could probably. Now it's just doing the transfer step. I'm gonna. Uh, I'll skip it toward the, toward the end here. So it sets up the installation, and so that's it. The next one's bigger, so I think it'll be easier. And if not, I can make it bigger. Is that one better? Should be better. Um. Yeah, it's better for me. I don't know. Ken was having. Is it better for you, Ken? Yeah. Sorry about that. That's always the. Fitting everything on the screen and making it readable is a challenge with the terminal. So this is just an example of the info. So you can just go to any title, type in SB Grid uh, CLI info, and then the name of the title, and you get um, you get this list of the title name, all of the versions that we have uh, for your platform. So I did this on my Mac. So this is just all the I mod versions from my Mac. Um, you can do a dash dash Linux, and uh, it'll show you all the versions for Linux. Um, but um, you know our collection, uh, a little description, and then some links. If we include additional uh, technical info, like you know you um, you need CUDA to run this, or uh, we you know, had to rename the executables, or some additional stuff, that will also show up here. Um, so. You can also see that your installed version is in green. So you can see I installed 4.11, so it's there. Uh, the default is listed. So uh, we usually make the defaults the latest, but um, uh, you don't have to use those. Sometimes the new ones are not as good as the old ones. So sometimes the new ones have bugs. In fact, it happens quite a lot. So uh, having the old one is usually good. So, uh, and then soon to come, we're gonna add into here uh, we have for some titles already just uh, size information. So how big is this thing on your disk or how much can you expect to have to download? Um, we already have the API internally built for that. So that's coming. Uh, we're including deprecation info. So if I'm going to pull a version of rely on, I know a lot of people are using lots of different versions. 
uh, we can't have every single version of every Reliant installed. So I'd like to give people some warning. So that will be in here. Um, so yeah, just more information as, as we go forward. So you'll be able to see where the where each title is sort of headed. All right, and I'm just a real quick one here just to show you the diagnostics. We can run a check connection. There's a few di diagnostic uh, features in the um, in the CLI. So um, this is just a check connection. Just shows you, okay, I can connect to our servers. So then I just went up and turned off my Wi-Fi. Uh, and then I run it again, and you can see that it will it will fail. So, uh, sync 2sbgridorg We is we have three, so that's the second one. That's uh, so it fails when my Wi-Fi is off. So, uh, if you're blocked by a firewall, it will show you which one of these ports is blocked, and you can't get out. And you can't get so you can actually reach out to your IT or your you know, ISP and say, is it possible that I could have port? 8080 or port 873 or something. I need to install software from SP Grid. And, and then you can always CC us on those emails and we're happy to. Uh, I think um, administrators like to hear from uh, other uh, other people to say, yes, that's uh, that's us and we can uh, we can provide you know, some info to back that up if, uh, if helpful. Right. So where would you use this? Uh, I think that the, uh, the CLI has some Good use cases in the lab. I think that it's great for laptops. It's uh, it's particularly nice because it has some new features. You can put the programs tree in different places from the command line. You can set up automatic updates. You can um, uh, you can install software on a machine and share it with lots of people if it's a lab computer. Um, uh, it's good for dedicated workstations that might not necessarily have access to like a network share with a big software stack. So sometimes for like you know, our pipelines or our you know, GPU machines, they might not necessarily be on the same network as this file servers that share the software, but they also only need a certain subset of the software. So this allows you to put the software on there, update it when you want to, particularly important for pipelines. You know, uh, we try not to sort of yank out versions because we don't want to break anybody, but, uh, and that's particularly true for pipelines. But it can happen, right? And um, so this way you can update when you want to update. And then you can also do kind of a rolling update where if you need to have the latest versions all the time, you can have uh, bleeding edge. Uh, uh, it's also great if you want to install somewhere besides your lab, right? So if you've got, um, if you want to install on your, in a VM in your local Windows machine, uh, and maybe even this new Windows subsystem for Linux, though I have not used it. I've seen some people using it, uh, it could work, but this might be a good way to get the software on there. The, um, uh, but it's great for VMs. Uh, so particularly if you want Linux software on Mac or Windows, if your local HPC center uses singularity containers, singularity containers allow you to sort of package up applications and you know, install them regardless of whatever their dependencies or namespaces require uh, and use them on a cluster. Uh, you can use this to install right into a container. If that's something that uh, appeals to you, reach out because at some point I was building containers for nearly everything we had in the tree. So it's pretty easy to do. The, um, uh, the install client is also good for Docker and pipelines. Most people just play around with Docker. Like if you just need to sort of trial an application or it requires too many privileges to make it really scalable in a sort of production environment, but sometimes it's useful. So. If you needed to run software in Docker, maybe you're using NVIDIA containers to try different environments for your GPUs or something, um, that's a possibility. It's good for the cloud. So if you're using EC2, Azure, you know, Google Cloud Platform, GCP, or just about any cloud, uh, you can, um, I've got a URL down here. It's, it's the AWS URL, but it's really usable on any cloud. You can just grab the CLI right from our, uh, uh, our web page from the command line and replicate your software stack in AWS or GCP or wherever you want to run and uh, run your applications and then you, know, you can install as needed. And uh, uh, the, uh, the software stacks themselves, you can save the configuration so that uh, if you had a configuration on your local machine and you just wanted to replicate that into 
say AWS, you can just load that saved file and it will reinstall all the applications that you had saved there. So it's a nice way to be able to like jump to the cloud. And, uh, one interruption about the, the cloud workflows, if, if you're gonna be spinning up a thousand different cloud machines, you shouldn't do the, the activate step in each one of those thousand machines or you're, or you're running up over the limit. So yeah. just to mention that as a problem that, you know, could be potentially run into. Yeah, we have, there is an activation limit on the, um, uh, which is the step when you first register. Uh, if you're gonna be activating a lot, just reach out. We don't really like, enforce the limits out of any reason aside from we just don't want to wake up one day and find out that like somewhere in Russia somebody activated 20,000 times or something right? like it's a it's just a reason just a sort of check to make sure that you know that the activations don't run up if I know you're a system administrator at you know, institution x and you manage 100 machines I can set your activation limit to be you know 200 or something and you can just sort of go until that runs out. It's just to make sure that you know, things don't go off the rails somewhere. Hey, Jason, uh, yeah. one quick question regarding activation because I just hit my limit of activation. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, it was, thank you for uh, approving it. But uh, when I was trying to run on my laptop, it gave me this warning that this is not registered anymore. Uh, in that case, should I just ask for a new key or is there a way to remove it? Or... You can use the, the same key. You can use the same key on, on whatever machines you want. Okay, got it. All right, yeah. thank you. So each key is usable on Mac or Linux, whatever machines. Once you have a key, you can just keep using that key. And can, so I have a laptop and a workstation at home and at work. So three systems, will one key work for all the three systems yep. or? Okay, yep. great. And great. I, I think I, I just, it brings up an important point and I try to mention this when people sign on, but if you've been on a member for a while, we don't limit the number of installations or activations necessarily, like sometimes, uh, it's useful to have, you know, all the machines in your lab plus the cloud, the local cluster, and maybe, especially right now, you want to have it in at home, right? So uh, you can install on as many machines as you need for all of the people in your group uh, as much as you want, right? So we don't, there's no limits. Um, you know, we um, we don't have uh, the only limits we sort of put on, uh, you know, this activation limit. It's just you know sort of a sanity check. We usually set it absurdly high anyway. It's just uh, you know it's just to make sure that you know people don't go and uh, install on a thousand computers or something, which yeah. would also be fine. Yeah. But you just have to tell us first. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, it's good for the cloud. Um, I should note that if you're going to go install on your local cluster, we still do require this you know sort of SP grid path, this slash programmed. Uh, that can be a deal breaker for a lot of HPC sites. So um, uh, we're working to sort of manage that, uh, but the cloud doesn't have that problem. Containers don't have that problem. So there are some ways to get around it right now. Um, uh, so if you're interested, if you don't have an account already, you can go register. If you do, you can go download it. None of these are mutually exclusive. You can use this with the existing, you can use it with the GUI. I mean, you can jump back and forth. It's fine. It's also already in the software tree if you have it installed its you know, in programs, your architecture, SP Grid installer. Um, the latest version should be in there. So 2.1.5 is the latest. So, I, uh, so that's the latest in our command line tool. I just want to say coming soon, uh, I've seen new builds of this coming up. Uh, so I'm excited. Uh, this is our graphical interface. It's built on the command line installer core. So same functionality underneath, but it exposes, you know, the, a nice interface for what's new, what's updated, you know, what webinars are coming up. Um, it has uh, the ability to queue up a bunch of tasks. You know, I want to install this and remove that or whatever, and then, you know, hit go and just let it uh, install and remove. And it should prompt you to, you know, install your updates and remove them. So it's um, it's going to be Mac and Linux, uh, and uh, yeah, it's going to be a nice way to manage. Again, you'll be able to just use both. You know, you could go back and forth. So if you're at the workstation and you want a GUI, you can use it. If you're a remote, you want a command line, you can use the command line tool. And uh, it'll be a nice way to interface with the software and uh, sort of manage what's going on with a little more information if you prefer a graphical interface. So I also just want to highlight that we have 
all of the same tools uh, available in a bioinformatics flavor that you know is a used. This is a software stack that's used at uh, HMS, Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, it's a set of it's SB grid like, but it's bioinformatics tools. So as a structural biologist, uh, uh, these are all tools that you know, they all end in seek and do amazing genomic analyses of things that I don't fully understand. But no fear, we have a bioinformatics expert on staff. So uh, we're just scaling this out. If you have interest, um, we're still trying to find, uh, you know, find legs for this, but it's been in use for years and, um, you know, reach out and uh, maybe we can uh, figure out a way to get this set up if it would be useful. I, uh, all the titles that we have are on the website. Uh, yeah, check it out and you can always email me at, uh, if it's something you think you'd be interested in. All right. Jason, uh, um, yeah. you might want to mention that tools that are shared between identical tools tools that are shared between BioGrids and SPGrid are actually the same installation. So it's not, it, it doesn't double your disk size. That's right. Yeah, it, they, um, the SPGrid and the BioGrid stack sort of set in the same space. So, uh, and they overlap to some degree. So uh, the, um, uh, you know, the core tools like Python or something, those are, just, but, you know, things like, well, I don't know, the NanoDoc here is, you know, a, bioinformatics tool that's uh, purely a biogrids title so so that's uh that's should we do a round of questions i think and then we'll jump into uh to carol's sorry i went a little long carol i hope i didn't take too much of your time hey jason i have a quick question sure go ahead um uh, uh, I know SP Grid is working on getting, and this is probably different from uh, the CLI, but SP Grid is working on getting M1 chips, uh, uh, compatible software. Uh, what made, I know it's a lot of work, but what made you make that decision to move to M1 and not stick with Intel? The reason I'm asking is because in future, if you want to get workstations that are Mac with M1 chips, or should we go for Intel? I think the Intel chips are going, going away. That's why we did it, right? I don't feel like we had a choice. I think with a lot of um, things, Apple, you know, Apple sets the terms and you just, you either go along or you ditch Apple, right? Like they don't, yeah. it's really their way or the highway. And okay. uh, it's, it was the same with, you know, Catalina introduced a bunch of um, you know, sort of security precautions. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoy having secure computing as much as the next guy, but they're kind of infuriating, right? I mean, you've, if you've used it, yes. you know, there's a lot of, you know, do you want this application to be able to run? Do you want this application to be able to read your desktop files? You know, it's good from a security perspective, but I don't think it's really uh, you know, gonna be a, a deal breaker for running scientific software, but it can be a little bit of a headache. Okay, and uh, on the same question, uh, is AMD Ryzen's also supported? Yeah, they they're a sort of standard uh, okay. x86 64 instruction set. Okay, uh, yeah the um, the way we compile software is we go back to I, I build most things on an Intel Haswell core. Okay, so that came out I think that's seven or eight years ago, and so. That has the same basic instruction set as the next one, which is the Broadwell. And then sometimes we do Skylake, which is the next one. And uh, rarely do we go ahead of that just because the, uh, otherwise you run into compatibility issues. So I think AMD chips, uh, they're nice and fast. We have some, uh, we could probably tweak things out a little more optimized, but in the name of compatibility, I don't think you'd see huge uh, gains anyway. Most structural biology applications are I/O bound anyway, so yeah. the CPUs matter, but they don't matter too much. So. Okay. Uh, the next question was on GPU. Uh, so right now, most of the programs that do support GPU support uh, NVIDIA. Uh, me being a layman in this field, uh, do you think with the AMD GPU coming in and Apple's M1 chip has GPUs, will it be easy for softwares to port into that? Like, will Will I have to buy NVIDIA GPUs in order to use SPGrid programs, or uh, can I buy any and it could be easily ported on those GPUs? For NVIDIA CUDA, you'll need NVIDIA. I don't think NVIDIA, I mean, CUDA, you know, if you read the CUDA, like 
uh, promotional page. It's supposed to be sort of cross-platform, but it's not. I mean, okay. it, it only runs on NVIDIA chips. There is There are um, GPU frameworks that you can, you know, like Open OpenCL. Uh, I saw that the most recent Gromax, the 2021 Gromax, uh, yeah. has really improved support for um, uh, alternative GPU acceleration um, frameworks. So presumably those could run. The M1s are fast, so that's another reason that we would, you know, plan to start building code for them. The uh, the jury's still out on whether or not we can use those for, you know, cry OEM, but uh, maybe we can do MD on them or something. Uh, yeah. I don't think that the uh, the ones in our laptops and Mac Minis are gonna are gonna cut it, right? But maybe if a Mac Pro comes out with like an M2 and it comes, you know, it's got 64 cores or something. A yeah. beast like that would be fantastic for like rely on, right? So, yeah. who knows? Thank you, thank you so much. Sure. I have just a simple question. I mean, uh, so at the moment you don't you don't preconize to upgrade to a Big Sur, isn't it? And we already have enough problems with Catalina, right? Yeah, I think you know Big Sur has been surprisingly okay. It's just a lot like Catalina. Um, some things don't work. I mean, some things don't work because of Big Sur and some things don't work because of uh, the M1 CPU. If you have to buy a new Mac, I mean, you know, get the new one with the like new CPU and stuff, unless you really depend on one of these applications that don't work. We have a list on our, um, on our wiki page of some of the applications that we know are problematic. Uh, that said, I've just been using it. We have a, you know, we got to test one I think ours came in like early December. So we went through and ran everything. We've got a test suite that we can use to run through and test a, a bunch of sort of like smoke tests on the applications. We've been tuning that up to run on, um, on the M1 and see like really, you know, which ones, because we don't test, you know, if we installed something five years ago, we might not go back and retest it, but this allows us to retest everything. Uh, I would get the new one and, you know, anything that's, modern will run. And um, uh, if you depend on 32-bit applications, then you're just stuck on 1014. So uh, everything forward won't run 32-bit. There's one in there that I th that is sort of heartbreaking, right? There's a bunch actually, but you know, NMR draw is 32-bit and it, uh, it is my personal favorite for looking at NMR spectra, but uh, it won't run on anything newer than 1014. So that's a bit of a bummer. Some of the old crystallography utilities are 32-bit. If we don't have source for them, we can't really fix them. Yeah, that's a pity with some of the things. Yeah, you're right. OK, thank you. Sure. One thing to jump in on about Big Sur, though, is that if you wanted to do rely on on a Mac, that's one of the things that we know doesn't work. Um, hello, my name is Carol Hurry, and I've been with um, Esprit Grid Consortium for, I think, five years, maybe six. Um, and my background is not structural biology, but my background is computer science. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is Esprit Grid capsules. And Esprit Grid capsules are, uh, is the way that we're managing the ability to have all of these software packages installed and to give the user flexibility on how they can manage, um, how they can use these different executables with conflicting environments. Um, you know, some of them require certain versions of libraries and, and other things and we try to isolate and that's the purpose of the term capsule or encapsulation is we try to isolate the environment to the capsule. Um, the SP grid capsule is basically packaging the executable and the environment together and that the environment is only instantiated when you actually run when you run the executable. Um, there's two pieces to it. It's the environment description and the actual executable that we built. Um, uh, the execution of the capsule initializes the application's environment. And then once the, it initiates, initiates the environment, it runs the actual executable, and then it discards the environment. 
And this allows you to have, for example, if you have two executables that you want to run that have different and they're Python executables and they have a different need for a Python path, um, it allows you to keep these, it keeps these requirements separated from each other. So um, typically, this is what a binary execution looks like. It opens a file descriptor, allocates memory, it has an environment, and it uses that environment for um, the linked libraries, and it, and it runs the executable. In a serial, um, you can see the two of them it does the same thing, but we're doing them serially, but the environment is the same. So whatever environment existed for executable one is the environment that'll exist for executable two. Oftentimes the way people worked around this was um, they would make separate shells or they would um, have to do some sort of manipulation around this. Our goal with capsules was to allow you to have one environment that would work for both executables. Uh, so that you wouldn't have to say, oh, I have to, you know, load this environment and then run it and then unload it and then load this environment and run it, that kind of thing. The other thing is, is we wanted to make it work well for um, and consistently the same, regardless of what hardware you were running on. So if you were running on a local laptop or you were running on a, uh, a that's a Mac and then you went to a Linux box, that was functioning as a server, or then you went to a um, you went to something that was a cloud-based um, installation. It would work the same at each in each instance. In capsules, I lost my mouse. In capsules, what we do is we have an executable, what you call from your shell. Um, we define that environment, then we open the file descriptor, allocate memory, use that environment with the linked libraries, etc. And when it's done running, that one goes away. And then we have this situation where the executables run, each one instantiates their own environment, uses whatever it needs from that environment, and, um, and then they, they don't interfere with each other. So if there was a conflict in anything, it would not interfere. Um, one of the things that was happening prior to going to capsules is we had dependencies between tools that we were unaware of because um, you would get them just by accident. So we didn't, we didn't know that a particular executable or a particular application had a dependency on another application because it happened to be installed. And, and we wouldn't find this out sometimes until somebody was in a situation where they only had one of the executable, one of the applications installed. And when they tried to run it, of course, failed because it wasn't there. So this um, helps us to be very much aware of what are the dependencies between. And, um, and I'd like to think it helps us to remove accidental, um, getting the wrong executable or getting the wrong, if you're running a pipeline, getting the wrong um, piece of the pipeline because you are sharing this environment. Um, so, um, the environment that's generated at runtime, uh, we use a language that was built um, at SB Grid called um, on the RC language. And basically what we end up with is we end up with a single path entry. All the library module and application paths are isolated to the executable. Um, it has a mechanism for handling duplicate executables. So in the old SB grid world, when we were just a monolithic path before capsules, you would get an entrance in the path for every application that we had. So if you had 400 applications installed, you would get 400 additions to your path. Um, in the capsule environment, you will get a single path entry. 
um, if you, in those 400 applications, if 200 of those applications did set Python paths or um, module paths or Perl 5Lib or anything like that, they would all be concatenated together and you would sometimes end up with a non-working order. Um, you know, we did everything that we could to prevent that from that non-working state. Um, but that usually involved us writing wrappers or doing something in that, in that, in that venue. Um, so the next thing is, is that because we have one path entry, if you have applications that have the same executable in them, then with that single path entry, we have to know that which of those duplicate, which of those um, repeated executable you want to use or, or needs to be used. And so we have built into capsules a mechanism for handling that. Um, we also have built in dependency controls, like I spoke of before. Um, we've become aware of dependencies between applications. We have added that into um, the ability of the capsule to know that. And then we've actually taken that knowledge that we have in our environment and we now apply it to our installation. So the knowledge from our environment when we build the application is then transferred into our install model so that when you install a product that has an uh, application with a dependency, you get that dependency. So. Um, these are our advantages or what we say is advantages. Um, you don't have any new commands to learn. You don't have to learn to load things or unload things or run or, or change things. Um, you don't have to manage the environment. We manage the environment for you. Um, we, the workflows that you use are, are defined and not left to the path order. And we give you better, more, um, better version management. You don't have to use sbgrid.com and resource your environment in order to change versions. So. And hopefully there's better transparency. Um, I think there's better transparency, but then, you know, I did a lot of the development on this, so I might be biased. So here's some examples. So um, we know that Coot is um, exists in several applications. So how would you know what applications? Well, we have a series of switches that go on a capsule that allow you to list out every application that has Coot. Um, and this is every application that has Coot in your current installation environment. So if you're working on your laptop and you only installed CCPEM, that would be the only one that would show up. It doesn't show you the other ones because you don't have them installed. Um, there's actually a help option to it. So you can see what all the SB app options are. And these options um, help you to manage duplicates yourself. And um, that's about it, I guess. Uh, so if you wanted to select Coot from a list, you would do the SB app colon S, and then you could just print out the list. Uh, the other thing that our capsules allow for, um, which this example doesn't show, is if you had a locally installed Coot uh, that maybe was installed somewhere else by someone else and you wanted to use that, we actually, uh, and it's in your path, uh, we would actually list that as number four instead of cancel. And it would give you the path to it. And you could select that through the capsule to use that one instead of the um, one that was provided by SB Grid. So it's Hello. simple. Yes. Now ask you a question. Sure. Yeah. So with this capsule mechanism, at the SB grid configure, if you want to overwrite the current version, is that still available? Yes. Yes. And actually, I have an example that'll show you how to do it. 
Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so here, this example shows you, like, if you wanted to run coot from coot, you would use the SB app colon A, um, and then you give it the application that you want to use, and then any, and once you've done that, then you could give it any of the options that are affiliated with coot itself, or with the, the executable itself. So here's the three, the three applications running the version. So you can just do this right at the command line, SB app colon A, the application name, and then any options that you want to use for that application. Now, um, the, there is a default one and you could actually do an SB app colon D, I believe, which will actually list out what the default is. So if you wanted to know, oh, what will be the default coot? If I just run coot without anything, what will I get? That's what you would do. To change version. So before we were saying, you know, it becomes easier not to change versions, or it becomes easier to change versions. If you were to look at the, the versions for coot, you can use the SB grid info command dash L, give it the application name, it lists out the version and the variable. Traditionally, you would have set this coot underscore X variable to the version that you want it to be in the dot SB grid config file. And then you would um, resource or source your SB grid environment again. Um, with capsules, you can still use that coot underscore X variable. But because the environment gets instantiated um, with each running of the executable, that means that you, all you have to do is set that environment variable, coot underscore X, to the version that you want before you run the executable. You don't need to resource the environment. You don't need to edit a file. There. Here's an example. So um, in this case, in these cases, you can see the first one where coot underscore X was set to the to that really long version. <laughs> um, and it just ran and it would use that version. And then you can just keep right at the command lines, just change the versions. This actually works out really easy because um, if you wanted to see like how something behaved in the previous version, versus what the results were in the latest version, you could just do that right at the same command line and compare the output and, and see what which version you need to use. Hopefully, it would be that easy for you. Um, if you do put a version into the .sb grid, con, um, .sb grid config file, that is still read and, and it is still respected by um, by the, um, by the capsule. So it's still, if you've put one there, if that's the version you want to use and you run the capsule without specifying the version, it will use the one that's in the config file. Um, what this allowed us to do, or what it allowed us to do is to do very easy. Uh, we had several several installations where they wanted to be able to use modules. And um, it allowed us to easily generate all of the modules using capsules. We, were easy, e we could easily generate all of the modules for the various tools. Uh, and still, even if you use the module, it basically instantiates the environment with each and every, you know, each capsule that you call. It, doesn't replace capsules, it just uh, enhances the capsule. So there's a couple of capsules tools. Um, if you have worked with the monolithic environment and you're curious about what, what capsule, if you have capsules enabled or not enabled, you can run the SB cap status um, and it'll tell you whether they're active or inactive. Uh, all of SB grid and bio grids, if you're using either one of those, uh, have capsules enabled by default. So a fresh install of SB Grid should have capsules enabled. 
if for some reason they weren't enabled or somebody um, turned them off and you want to get back to the um, get back to the default, you can do SPCAP reset. There's also a help option for SPCAP that'll show you how you can turn them on and off if you wanted to. Um, I recommend using them. And if you have a problem, letting us know because they really are the, you know, the direction that we're moving. We're doing more and more things with capsules. Uh, another tool that avail is available is SBGrid-Lisp list with an app, and that will list all the capsules in a given application. So if you're if you you know wanted to know all of the capsules in uh, in Python, you could do SBGrid list and it would tell and Python and it would tell you. So what did capsules allow us to do? So some of the things that capsules allowed us to do is it allowed us, first of all, to integrate executable testing. So when, um, when Jason was talking about the smoke tests that we were able to run, um, all of these came about because we were able to do them with the capsules. So the testing mechanism is actually a capsule itself which instantiates the environment and then runs the test and then removes the environment. And we have been running these automated tests across several OSs. Um, I don't think we're running them across this many currently, but we do use this to help us decide whether or not things are, um, things are sane or not. And they're really smoke tests. They're not, they're not testing functionality. They're testing, do we have the right environment? Do, you know, do things just you know, generally run? Like, can I run help? Can I you know, get version? Can I uh, you know, do some of these simple things and you know, get the right result? Um, it gave us better visibility into required dependencies. So SB Grid Info, um, now we'll list out any of the information about dependencies. If there's a dependency, for example, in this case, Eman2, there are different versions of Eman2 have a dependency on different versions of MPI. Um, and it'll print that out and show you what it's, what it's using. This is also true when, when um, an application might be using Python. It'll show you which version of Python it's using if it doesn't provide its own. And um, it gives us a little bit faster, more robust software installation. And from, from an end user's perspective, because it doesn't use anything that isn't already on your system. You don't have to install any um, you don't have to install any other tools to your work with it. And you don't have to have root access at all or any admin access to use it. If you can have access to um, the SB Grid installation, or if you have installed SB Grid yourself as a, a regular user, other than the link from programs, um, then you're ready to go after you source sbgrid.shrc, of course. So if you're interested in more information, we do have a wiki page on capsules. That's um, at the sbgrid.org website. And um, you know, I totally appreciate feedback from it. Um, there's, it's, it actually shows you the full help here. Um, and there are features that I didn't, of course, cover. But anyway, any questions? Back to you, Jason. Well, actually, so what one thing that my favorite capsule tip, which Carol kind of touched on but didn't really highlight, is if you if you're in a case where you know are you working on a project, I've been using a particular version of a package, and there's an update available, or there's several updates available. Capsules make it very easy for you to say, run this analysis script, 
with each different version of the title that's available and let me see are the newer versions better than the old ones or not. Yeah, I use it. I use it internally to uh, to run every version of rely on on a 3D classification, just in a script that just sets the rely on variable, runs the 3D classification, sets the variable, runs it, just run through ten versions and do just a quick benchmark. You know, well, quick it takes a whole weekend, but it's uh, uh, <laughs> it, it's a way to go through and run everything where all I have to do is change a variable. I just iterate across. I mean, it's like a four line script, so it's uh, it makes it super easy and. Uh, it also, um, the other thing that, that well, and this was more from my experience of when I was um, working on the biogrid side, a lot of the, a lot of the things that I was working on when I was on the biogrids, working on biogrids were pipelines. A, a lot of the stuff in the biogrid space were pipelines and, and they would have these dependencies on all these other tools and particular versions of these tools and and things like that. And, and it was interesting because a new version would come out and I'd be like, oh, does that work with like a new version of the same, like a new minor version? And it'd be like, oh, does that work? And it made it very easy to say, oh, yeah, that pipeline still works with that upgraded minor version. So, um, you know, it helps to make those decisions. Yeah, and you know, just back to the uh, the primary design. One of the primary design goals is that you wouldn't have to really even know that they're there. So, and if you don't, then that's great. That means that things are working. So that's uh, that's fantastic. But that allows us to do things like use three different Python versions in a pipeline or something, and it all just sort of works under the hood, right? So, I mean, that that happens in a number of applications. So. And it's becoming more and more common. So you've got these, you know, tools like Cypion or something, right? That include, you know, twenty different uh, cryo EM programs, and uh, they sort of pass data in between them. But each one of those programs needs its own sort of environment. It needs its own, uh, you know, sometimes it needs an older Python. Maybe it needs a new one. Maybe it needs incompatible modules or something. So with this, we can go in and sort of define, okay, this Python, you get this environment, this Python, you get that environment, and then uh, sort of avoid conflicts. And uh, yeah. sometimes it results in, you know, things fail because they, um, they shouldn't have been working in the first place, right? Like in the sense that they're using you know, the, in the wrong environment to, uh, uh, to sort of find what they need. And then just by luck, you know, happened that it found a Python in Eman2, right? But, you, know, you don't want it to work that way, right? You want it to use you know, defined software. You know, you want to know what you write on, right? So this allows you to do that. I, I think I think the thing that I found more in, most interesting as we um, as we were rolling out capsules more and more was when we would do the monthly updates. It seemed that as capsules became more the standard. We got less of the, less of the, um, I did the update and now this doesn't work. We seem to get less of those, you know, the tool works, but because the other, because we updated a piece that it was calling by accident, you know, it just, I don't know. I haven't done any real data analysis of that though. Yeah, it's much, much more surgical now. All right, great. Well, thank you all for coming. Be sure to uh, you know check out uh, the rest of the schedule on spgrid.org. Uh, we've got a couple of really cool talks coming up. So, um, and you can always catch them on the recording if you happen to miss them. Uh, but in your person, you get to you get to ask questions. You know, I think uh, that's that's worth something, especially you know since that's my only interaction with scientists these days is through Zoom. Uh, that's pretty good. And then. Um, yeah, if you have any other questions regarding Carol's talk or mine, feel free to drop us an email. I'm gonna hang out for a while. So if, uh, if anybody wants to talk, chat, ask questions, you know, bounce ideas, um, happy to do so or, you know, on, on anything really from uh, you know, capsules to cryo EM to hardware, whatever's you know, going on in your, uh, 
in your research environment? 